and I'm going to sing you a really sweet song all about the letter N. Oh, oh, the letter N? The letter N. Welcome to my course on game theory. My name's Matt Rosu. I am dropping videos throughout this semester as I am teaching game theory course on the Susquehanna University campus. So everybody can follow along with a subject that I think is absolutely fascinating and gives incredible insight into how to think through complex issues. If you want to check out the previous lessons, you can go to the description. I have a link to the playlist for the fall game theory course. Uh, this is fall 23 game theory course. And hope you enjoy this particular lesson, which I find fascinating on N person games. Now here the N is standing for any number. You know, it can N can be any number, but we've already covered two player and three player games. So N is studying games that have more players, some number that's higher than three. Why is this important? Well, to this point we've limited our games to two or three player games. Two players have two player games have received the majority of the attention in the course. And you can really learn a ton from two-player games and how people interact. And it's not too difficult to think of how to extend in certain situations to more than two players. We have also looked at three-player games, which really follow the same general idea as a two-player game. Just adds a third player, naturally. But many games really have far more than three players. They could have dozens, hundreds, thousands, or even millions of players. There is a list here, you know, economic competition, highway congestion, environmental games, uh, monetary exchange, any dealings with money, currency rates, uh, a whole host of other games that are really better thought of as n-person games where there's a large number of players. We can't take the same tools that we used before. Games would get too difficult way too fast as we start to add more than three players. So I just put up on the screen here, if you have eight separate players, there are literally eight factorial relationships between the players. It's over 40,000 different possible relationships. So even with just eight, it's not feasible. We, we must simplify in order to solve the games. And imagine what happens once you're dealing with hundreds, thousands, or millions of players, right? We have to think a little bit differently and come up with a couple simplifications in order to solve these games. So two key ways that we simplify are by using representative agents and state variables. So what do we mean by representative agents and state variables. The representative agent is a case where we assume that every single player in the game, or agent, faces the same strategies and gets the same payoffs, right? This is somebody who's representative. Now we could extend to say that there's a couple different representative agents that have slightly different you know, incentives, payoff structures, preferences, but we, for this class, we're going to be assuming a representative agent that has a particular set of preferences. So we have an agent, but everybody has the same set of preferences. So if you're dealing with a million people, all million people have the same distaste for waiting in line, for example. The same utility function, the same payoff structure, all of that. And that's a simplification that is this entirely accurate? Well, that, no, right? This is an assumption we have to make. But as you'll see, by making this assumption, we end up getting some pretty good insights and realistic results as we start to go through some example games. So representative agent, that's the first simplification. The second simplification is using a state variable. The state variable is how we describe the current state of the world or of the game. So how do you summarize all of the actions of all of the players in the game? Recall for two player games and three player games, especially if they're sequential, have to think through what is the current state of the world for each of the given players. Here we have a state variable, one thing that summarizes 
exactly what is happening in the particular game. So a player who knows the value of the state variable has every piece of information needed in order to come up with the best response strategy, which is what we need in order to solve a particular game. I think these two concepts, representative agent and state variable, become clearer when we go through an example, so let's go do that now. We will start with the commuter game. So we'll consider n players, each are considering driving a car or taking a bus to work. Every player gets a payoff of 10 from driving, 8 from riding the bus. Each person's payoff decreases by 1 for every other person who drives a car. So the two questions that we relate back to what we need for this game, what is the state variable and what would our representative agent's payoff function look like? Well, the state variable is the number of people who are driving. There's a payoff of 10 minus the number of other drivers for driving a car. There's a payoff function of 8 minus the number of other drivers for taking a bus. In order for a player to make their best response, they need to know how many other people are driving. So that is the state variable in this game. So we talked about n players, some number of players. Each player has a separate payoff function of uh, where they get 10 from driving, 8 from the bus, but you subtract 1. This is our representative agent. It's, it's the driver, and everybody has the same payoff function. So what does the representative agent's payoff function look like? Well, by equation form or through equation form, you know, the payoff from driving equals 10 minus one times each other driver on the road. The payoff for taking the bus equals 8 minus one times each other driver on the road. That is the representative agent's payoff functions in equation form. We can also put this graphically. If there are no other drivers, payoff to drive, simply 10. But for each other driver, the payoff function decreases by 1, and we see this line here for the payoff for driving a car. Taking a bus, payoff is 8 minus 1 times each other person on the road. So it starts at 8 and it decreases by 1. And we'll notice for this particular example that these don't ever intersect. Well, if they don't intersect, that actually tells us something pretty powerful. By not intersecting, it shows us that each agent, all of our players in the game, have a dominant strategy to drive a car. The equilibrium in this game, everybody drives. The problem, as long as you have three players or more, this isn't efficient. Because if you had three players and they all took the bus, they would have a payoff of eight each. If you have three players and they all drive, they get 10 minus, um, well, I said three, let's say it's three other players. 10 minus three, all of a sudden the payoff is seven. It's a lower payout. And if you're dealing with five or 10 people, all of a sudden the payoff is considerably lower than if everybody took the bus. It's kind of an example of the tragedy of the commons type example or problem in that each individual has an incentive to do one thing, but that could hurt the collective payoffs of the group. So interesting problem on this, but this is a good example of an n-person game. And one thing that I think is also useful to think about, and I won't put equations up, but I will show a graph. How might this be different if this was driving versus going on the subway? And I'll give you a moment to think through how this might look graphically. And if you want, pause the video and try to plot this out. But it would look different. So if it was the subway, the number of other drivers shouldn't matter. So that should be a flat payoff, whereas driving, the number of other drivers does matter. And that means if, you, if this is the outcome, you're going to have some number of drivers that's an equilibrium number on the road that is not equal to zero and it's not equal to all of them. Whether somebody would want to drive or not would depend on the value of the state variable, which is the number of others on the road. Fascinating, a simple example with the commuter game that can help shed some light into n-person games for us. 
Hope you enjoyed this short lesson on in-person games. Plenty more game theory content is coming, so please like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.